Welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to be discussing paid in kind or pick interest here, especially in the context of leveraged buyout models. So the typical question we get about paid in kind interest goes like this. Can you explain paid in kind interest? Does it boost a private equity firm's returns? What about the lenders? Why is it so common in leveraged buyouts? What changes in the model? And then what about the tax effects of this specific feature of debt in leveraged buyouts? So if you want this tutorial in writing along with screenshots and the full Excel model, you can go to this URL, just breaking into wallstreet.com slash KB slash leveraged buyouts and LBO models slash pick dash interest. I'll pin this below the video so you can just click it and go there. I'm going to give you the short answer here in a few minutes, and then we'll go into some longer answers that delve into specific topics raised here. So paid in kind interest accrues to the loan principal, increasing the balance of the loan in each period rather than being paid in cash as interest traditionally is. The overall effect is that the company's cash flows and debt repayment capacity increase during the holding period, but then more debt needs to be repaid upon exit. So paid in kind interest is a bit like kicking the can down the road. You don't have to worry about that interest today in cash payments, but you are going to have to worry about a ballooning debt balance in the future. In terms of the effects, the cash on cash or money on money multiple for the lenders does change because with paid in kind interest, you're changing the total amount of debt principal that needs to be repaid, but the internal rate of return or IRR does not change since it assumes reinvestment of all the proceeds. For the private equity firm, the impact on the returns could go either way. It really depends on the cash flows and the exit assumptions, but the overall effect tends to be quite small. On the financial statements, paid in kind interest always appears as normal interest expense on the income statement, but it gets added back on the cash flow statement as a non-cash expense there. So to bring up our Excel file, here's a very simple leverage buyout model done for 12 times EBITDA. The leverage ratio is five times EBITDA, about 313 million total of debt being used right now. And currently the interest rate is 8%. You can see that we have a very traditional setup here with cash interest. It reduces the pre-tax income and the net income. And then we have net income. We add back a bunch of aligned items or adjust for them on the cash flow statement. And then we have our beginning cash, free cash flow, minimum cash. That gives us our cash flow available for debt repayment. And the debt balance here stays the same. The cash balance keeps growing. And then we exit. We have the same debt balance, but a higher cash balance by the end. Now, if we change this to paid in kind, I'll say 100% of the interest is now paid in kind. We still deduct it on the income statement and the pre-tax income and the net income here are still affected by this paid in kind interest. However, you'll note that the paid in kind interest itself goes up each period because the debt balance here now goes up in each period this paid in kind interest accrues directly to this debt principal. And so whenever we have this paid in kind interest, the debt principal keeps going up. Now we add back this paid in kind interest on the cash flow statement. And so the overall cash flow during the holding period is higher as a direct result. The paid in kind interest reduces the company's taxes, but doesn't actually cost it anything in cash. And it simply increases the debt balance by the end. So that is a quick overview of how it works on the financial statements in the context of a leveraged buyout model. Paid in kind interest usually is tax deductible, just like normal interest, but there may be some exceptions for certain equity like securities, which we'll look at later on. If you're wondering why private equity firms and companies use paid in kind interest in the first place, it's mostly useful for somewhat riskier companies that have spotty cash flows. They can only support so much in cash interest. Maybe the company's going through a major turnaround. Paid in kind interest in these cases lets the companies take on more debt in a leveraged buyout than they'd normally be able to support based on their pure cash flows. So that's the short answer. In terms of the more detailed topics here, we're going to cover paid in kind versus cash interest in an LBO first, and I'll show you the step-by-step -step process in the formulas. Then we'll go to the returns to lenders and the impact on those. Then we'll look at debt principal repayments and how they affect paid in kind interest and debt. And then we'll look at paid in kind interest and the possible tax impact and what happens if it is not tax deductible. So let's go to the first topic here, the paid in kind versus cash interest in LBO. So to illustrate all this, I'm going to go back to a default version of this Excel file that has nothing filled in for the interest and some of the other formulas. So I can show you what happens step by step. Now, the first step is that you still want to record interest on the income statement based on the interest rate times the debt balance. So let's go in and do this right now. We're going to get the debt balance from the previous period. So right when the deal takes place, we'll multiply by the interest rate percentage here, the 8%. And then for the cash interest expense, we're just going to multiply by one minus the paid in kind portion right here. So in this case, we do not actually have any cash interest. For the paid in kind interest, we'll take the same formula, but now we'll multiply by the paid in kind interest percentage instead, which is 100% 
in this case. And so now we've reflected this on the income statement. And regardless of whether the interest is cash or paid in kind, the pre-tax income is lower as a result, since we are subtracting depreciation and amortization and the interest when going from EBITDA to pre-tax income. Now, the next step is that we want to add back this paid in kind interest on the cash flow statement, very similar to depreciation. So let's go down and do that right now. Paid in kind interest, we're going to link to it on the income statement and simply reverse the sign right here. So we link this in and our cash flow available for debt repayment goes up as a direct result of this. Now, we also want to make sure that the paid in kind interest increases the debt balance in each period. So let's go down to the debt formula and take a look at this. Right now, the debt balance is constant because we're linking to the old number and just subtracting the cash flow used for debt repayment. But of course, we need to add this paid in kind interest. So I'm going to go up here and do this. And now you can see the impact. The debt balance here goes to a much higher level by the end, which you can see in the returns calculations right here. You can also see how now the paid in kind interest itself is going up in each period because the debt balance is growing in each period. And then at step four, you want to make sure that all the existing formulas reflect these changes as well. So it's worth going in and checking things like the pre-tax income formula and the debt and cash formulas here, and even the free cash flow formula, and making sure that they capture the impact of everything that we just went in and changed. It's also worth checking the ending debt balance and the ending cash balance and making sure that these still make sense. And it seems like they do overall, at least in this case, where we're assuming that there are no debt principal repayments here. In other words, we have some cash flow available for debt repayment, but for whatever reason, we're simply choosing not to actually repay debt early in this leverage buyout model. So what is the impact of paid in kind interest here? Well, in this case, it slightly reduces the IRR. And to illustrate that, let's go up and let's change this to zero for the paid in kind portion. The IRR is about 15.3%, a 2x money on money multiple. When we change it to 100%, the IRR drops slightly to about 14.9%. And the reason this happens is because the debt balance is simply much bigger by the end. And in this case, it hurts us and reduces the IRR. So there's a higher debt balance to repay. Now the cash flows do go up, but it doesn't really make a difference because these cash flows are not being distributed in this period. So although the cash flows are stronger, they don't really help us as the equity investor because we're saving them up all the way until the very end and we get them back then. If we got these back earlier on, then we might see less of a difference in the IRR or it might even improve depending on the assumptions. So let's talk about the returns to lenders now. The basic idea here is that the multiple is going to change because with paid in kind interest, the loan principal increases and more has to be repaid by the end. So toward the bottom of this LBO model, I have this schedule for returns to lenders. It's what they pay upfront with the new debt issued to fund this deal. And then they get back a certain amount at the end. They earn cash interest in between and if there are any debt principal repayments, they also get those back. So if I go up and I go from, let's change this to 0% paid in kind interest first. The multiple is 1.4X and it's an 8% IRR. You can see how they get the cash interest and a lower debt balance back at the end. When I change this to 100% paid in kind interest, now they get no cash interest, but they get a higher balance at the end. And the money on money multiple here is 1.5X. So the multiple goes up, but the IRR stays the same. Now, the reason the IRR stays the same is that the IRR function assumes that the proceeds are reinvested at the same rate of return as the IRR. In other words, from the perspective of the IRR function, earning 8% cash per year on an initial loan balance of $100 over five years is the same as earning back that $100 times one plus 8% raised to the power of five for the five years. Now, you can adjust for this with something like the MIRR function, which lets you assume a different reinvestment rate for the proceeds. But this is how it works with the baseline IRR function in Excel. Let's talk about debt principal repayments and paid in kind interest. The short answer here is that for lenders, it's the same idea. The multiple will change, but the IRR stays the same because of the reinvestment assumption. Let's go to Excel and switch on the principal repayments right here so you can see how this works. So now we are actually using some amount of cash flow for debt repayment right here. And as a direct result, our debt balance is much lower by the end, but our cash balance is also much lower by the end because it doesn't build up to anything. For the lenders, the money on money multiple here is lower. They get these debt principal repayments and they get a much lower amount of debt principal repaid upon exit. If we change this and we said that now we're not going to allow debt principal repayments, the money on money multiple increases to 1.5x, but the IRR stays the same at 8%.
Now for the PE firm, they should see a higher multiple and IRR with debt principal repayments and pay to kind interest because instead of just letting the cash sit around, they can actually use it to do something to reduce the debt balance early, which reduces the interest expense and improves the cash flow and everything else. And again, you can see it here, no debt principal repayments, a 2X multiple and a 14.9% IRR. When we enable debt principal repayments, we get to a 2.1X multiple and a 15.9% IRR because this cash balance is no longer useless. The cash is now actually being used to reduce the debt, which means that we have less to repay at the very end. Now, one last point I wanna to touch on here is the tax effect. Now, in most cases, paid in kind interest is fully tax deductible, just like any other interest expense on the income statement, but there are some exceptions for certain equity-like securities. For example, in some cases, convertible preferred stock, if it has paid in kind interest attached, the paid in kind interest may not be fully deductible because the government might consider this more of an equity security and they don't really want to give a tax break to standard equity investors in a company or deal like this. However, the rules differ a lot based on your region. There are some exceptions for securities like shareholder loans, depending on the region or country that you're in. So this one is a very case by case thing and you have to be careful. But in general, it depends more on the security type that the paid in kind interest is attached to rather than the fact that it is accrued rather than paid in cash. If you want to reflect this, you can just add a deferred tax line item on the cash flow statement that's equal to the negative of the paid in kind interest times the tax rate. So let's go up and do this and let's change the tax deductibility here to zero for no. And then let's go down to the deferred tax line. We'll go up to paid in kind interest. We'll put a negative in front. I'll link to one minus this switch right here so that if this is one, nothing changes. There's nothing for the deferred tax line. But if this is no, meaning zero, then this is one and we show something here and then we'll multiply by the tax rate. And so now you can see that we do get a negative effect from this. And so our cash flows here are hurt slightly when the paid in kind interest is not fully tax deductible. So that's about it. Let's do a quick summary. Paid in kind versus cash interest in an LBO. Paid in kind interest just means it accrues to the loan balance. The loan balance keeps increasing and the overall interest expense keeps increasing over time as a result. Generally, there's not a huge impact for the private equity investors in the deal. For the lenders, the returns to lenders, the IRR stays the same, but the money on money multiple changes and it tends to increase with paid in kind interest because they get more principal back at the end. Now, if there are debt principal repayments in the holding period, generally that improves things for the private equity firm because they can actually get something useful out of that cash balance. For the lenders, the IRR stays the same once again, because the IRR function assumes reinvestment of the proceeds at the same rate. However, the multiple tends to decrease when they get debt principal repayments earlier before the exit, because the debt principal upon exit is lower. And then finally for taxes, usually paid in kind interest is tax deductible, but if it's not, I showed you how you can add a deferred tax line item and record a small negative impact to reflect that on the cash flow statement and reduce the company's cash flow. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about paid in kind interest and how it can come up in LBO models and other case studies.